The film opens on a peaceful Christmas Eve, the warmth of the season embracing the air. A couple sleeps soundly, their home wrapped in stillness, but the serenity is broken when their young daughter gently shakes her mother awake. Mom, someone's walking on the terrace, she whispers, her voice tinged with innocent curiosity. Her mother smiles softly, brushing away her concern. It's probably just an animal, honey, she reassures. But the girl's eyes light up with excitement. But, Mom, could it be Santa? It's Christmas, she asks, hope sparkling in her voice. Her mother chuckles and plays along. Maybe it is. Why don't we leave milk and cookies for him? With a nod, the girl smiles, satisfied. As her mother makes her way to the kitchen, the house feels almost too quiet, the kind of quiet that makes you feel like something is lurking just out of sight. She places the milk and cookies down, but as she turns to leave, a chill runs through her when she notices the front door slightly ajar. Her mind tries to reason it away. Maybe my husband forgot to close it, she thinks, closing the door and shaking off the unease. Back in the bedroom, she casually tells her husband, your daughter's left milk and cookies for Santa. You should eat them before she wakes up. He grumbles in agreement, and they drift back to sleep. But their daughter remains wide awake, her ears picking up a soft, unsettling sound. Footsteps, not from the terrace, but inside the house. Her heart pounds as she tiptoes downstairs. And then she sees him, Santa, or at least, someone dressed like him. But something is terribly wrong. His movements are strange, jerky, like a puppet on strings. Fear grips her as she hides behind the door, her small body trembling. She watches with wide, terrified eyes as Santa pulls an axe from his sack, his hands stained red with blood. This isn't Santa. This is something far more sinister. Her breath catches in her throat as she realizes who this is, a nightmare in the flesh. Or the clown. The stories were true. A demon in the guise of a twisted joker. Relentless killer who leaves nothing but destruction in his wake. Her brother's room. The thought floods her mind, just as are the clown begins his merciless attack. The sickening sound of the axe cutting through flesh fills the air each blow more horrifying than the last. She can't move, she can't scream. She's frozen in terror as her brother's lifeless body is torn apart, piece by piece. The girl's heart races as she tries to stifle her sobs. But our the clown is relentless, moving next to her parents' room. Her mother stirs awake, confusion turning to horror as her hand touches the warm, sticky blood covering the bed. She turns to see her husband, a mangled, unrecognizable heap beside her. The scream that escapes her is pure terror, but it's already too late. Are the clown's axe falls again and again, each strike sending shockwaves through the house. Desperate, her mother runs, her mind spinning as she races to her children's room, hoping, praying, that her son is still alive. But the sight of his torn body is too much, and her cries of anguish fill the room. She stumbles down the stairs, heading for the door, but before she can reach it, the axe comes whistling through the air. It's over. Are the clown watches with cold, calculating eyes as her body falls to the ground. He sits down calmly, as if nothing has happened, and begins to eat the milk and cookies left for Santa, wiping the blood from his hands. As he opens a nearby cupboard, a quiet whimper catches his attention. The child was hiding there. Terror fills the air, thick and suffocating, as are the clown's shadow looms over the last survivor. The clown's insanity surged once again, a chilling reminder of his relentless cruelty. Without hesitation, he snuffed out the innocent child's life, his evil unstoppable. Then, in a sudden jolt, the story rewinds five years, plunging us into the past where Art's reign of terror had already begun. The blood-soaked scene haunted by a policeman who stumbles upon Art's severed head, cold and detached. But before he can call for backup, an unimaginable horror unfolds. Art, without a head, rises from the dead. He creeps behind the officer, his lifeless form alive again. Shots are fired, but they do nothing. The officer, helpless, is soon dealt with, his fate sealed. Art, now alive with his macabre trophy in hand. The officer's severed head boards a train where a lone woman sits. The scene is grotesque, her fear palpable as she sees the severed head theatrically positioned. Her terror consumes her, and just when it seems like the madness can't get worse, the scene shifts. We find ourselves in a mental asylum. A scream pierces the air, coming from a cell. The guard rushes to investigate and is met with an unspeakable sight. Vicky, a mad patient, had given birth. But not to a child. No, to Art's head, still alive, grotesque, and dangerous. The nurse was dead, her body mutilated by the monstrous head. Vicky, too, had been corrupted by Art's madness. She wasn't human anymore, her face disfigured, her actions monstrous. She had become like him, cruel, merciless, her humanity gone. On the wall, a twisted symbol of her newfound allegiance. She had scrawled a heart with Vicky plus Art inside it. The sight horrified the guard, but before he could react, 
Vicky attacked him. Together, she and Art showed their brutality, tearing the guard apart in a savage display. With a grotesque satisfaction, Vicky took Art's head and boarded a train with him. They traveled to an abandoned house where Vicky, in a fit of madness, shattered a mirror and slashed her own hand, filling a bathtub with her blood. Art watched, sitting in eerie silence, as Vicky immersed herself in the blood-filled tub, lost in her insanity. For five years, she stayed like that, trapped in a state of madness and bloodlust. The story shifts again, back to the present. Sienna, a girl who had been in a mental hospital for five years, was haunted by the horrific events of her past. Five years ago, Art had destroyed everything, her friends, her innocence. She had managed to decapitate him with a magical sword, Heaven's Black Sword, but the trauma had left deep scars. Even though she was physically healed, the memories tormented her. Now, finally, she was released from the hospital. Her uncle took her home, where she reunited with her aunt and cousin. It was a moment of happiness, but beneath the surface, the horror lingered. Meanwhile, two workers, tasked with demolishing an old building, stumbled upon the corpses of Vicky and Art. Though their bodies were covered in nets, they were strangely preserved, untouched by decay. Before the workers could process what they were seeing, the bodies came back to life. Vicky and Art, driven by their sadistic urges, brutally killed the workers without mercy. At home, Sienna's cousin accidentally touched her diary, a book filled with the horrors of the past. Sienna snatched it back, warning him never to touch it again. That evening, while they were all eating together, Sienna saw a ghost, a twisted version of her dead friend, the same one Art had killed. No one else could see the apparition, and Sienna's mind was still fractured by the trauma, unable to escape the horrors of her past. The story then shifts to Sienna's brother, who had been living in a hostel. There, he meets two of his friends, one of whom was now hosting a crime podcast. She was obsessed with Art, fascinated by the infamous clown, and was eager to interview Sienna and her brother, believing they held the key to uncovering more about Art's twisted history. But Sienna's brother, shaken by the memories, hesitated. Then, Sienna calls him, her voice trembling with emotion. I miss you, she says, her words carrying the weight of her pain and trauma. She wanted him to come home, to see her, perhaps to find some sense of normalcy after years of darkness. But little did they know, Art and Vicky were still out there, lurking in the shadows of that empty house, waiting for their next move. Art stood there, the coldness in his eyes reflecting the cruelty he was about to unleash. His mind raced with twisted excitement, searching for a new way to inflict pain, to break his victims in the most merciless way imaginable. The thought of watching someone suffer in the bitter cold, the sharp sting of frozen wounds, sent a chill of pleasure through him. He knew, as everyone knew, that cold only worsened the pain, made every wound scream with agony. And so, his next experiment was born. A mouse became his first victim. Art's hands trembled with anticipation as he froze the tiny creature, watching it slowly succumb to the ice. And when the time came, he snapped its frozen body like a toy, the sound of cracking bones filling the air. Art's lips curled into a smile. Soon, he would try this on a human. The thought of it thrilled him, and his heart raced with dark joy. Now, his next prey awaited. Art wandered into a bar, eyes scanning the room. Laughter filled the space. But Art's gaze locked on a man dressed as Santa. He approached, his tone light and joking at first, his grin almost friendly. But beneath the surface, his true nature simmered. Slowly, Art began to reveal his tricks, tormenting the man, pushing him to the edge. The others, fed up with his cruelty, tried to intervene. But Art was ready. With one swift motion, he pulled out his bag and unleashed chaos. Gunshots echoed through the bar. Bodies fell one by one. Only Santa was spared. For now, Art tied him to a chair, savoring the terror in the man's eyes. The room grew colder, and as the temperature dropped, so did Santa's hope. The frost crept into his bones, freezing him from the inside out. And then, with a hammer in hand, Art began his merciless work. The sound of metal meeting flesh was sickening, each blow more brutal than the last. Santa's body shattered under the force, lifeless and broken. Meanwhile, Sienna, unaware of the horror unfolding, clutched a letter from her brother. In it, he had written about demons, creatures from hell who could only act through the dead, evil souls. And Art, he was no ordinary killer. He was something far worse. A demon, using the soul of a vile human as his vessel. Her brother's words echoed in her mind. There must be someone to fight them. Angels. And one of them is you, Sienna. Sienna had already defeated Art once, but the fear that he had returned gnawed at her. Her heart raced as she walked through the mall with her cousin, the normalcy of the day a thin veil over her growing dread. Then she heard it, screams. They pierced the air, sending a shiver down her spine. She knew it. She could feel it. Art was back. And there he was, sitting as Santa. 
his red suit stained with blood, a grotesque mask covering his face. But Sienna knew. She recognized the darkness in his presence. Her chest tightened, fear and rage colliding within her. She turned away for a moment, but when she looked back, he was gone. At home, Sienna's heart pounded as she told her brother what she had seen. It was him. I know it was Art, she whispered, her voice trembling. But her brother shook his head, disbelief clouding his face. You killed him, he said, trying to reassure her. It's over. But Sienna knew better. She showed him the letter. Art came back through Vicky this time, she explained. That's why he's missing from the asylum. Fear flashed in her brother's eyes as the realization sank in. What do we do now? He asked, his voice barely steady. Do we run? Go to the police? But Sienna's resolve hardened. No one will believe us, she said quietly. They think I'm crazy. We have to find the sword. It's the only way to stop him. At the mall, Art continued his twisted game, disguised as Santa. The real Santa was long gone, his skin and beard now Art's grotesque trophies. He handed out gifts to children, each one more sinister than the last. But as the mothers watched, suspicion grew. Something about this Santa was wrong, too disturbing to ignore. The guards noticed too, and they moved in to remove him. But it was too late. The children opened their gifts, and the world exploded. Fire and chaos consumed them all, bodies thrown through the air as the bombs hidden in the presence detonated. The laughter of moments ago turned into screams of horror, and the mall became a fiery grave. Sienna found the sword, hidden in a gift box, her heart pounding with the weight of her destiny. She knew she had to fight. She had to stop Art. Her cousin's voice broke through her thoughts. You like series, right? He asked, unaware of the storm brewing in Sienna's soul. But Sienna knew there was no time for distractions. Art was out there, and the battle had just begun. Sienna's heart pounded as she realized her mistake. She had brought her cousin upstairs, leading her into a dangerous conversation. Her cousin's voice trembled slightly. I never told you I like those kinds of series. How could I tell you? There was a pause, a moment of dread. You've read my diary, haven't you? Her cousin swallowed hard, guilt flickering in her eyes. Yes, and I'm sorry. I read it after you asked me not to. I just had to know, what happened to you? The things you wrote about Art the Clown. Are they true? Sienna's breath caught in her throat. She felt a knot of panic tightening in her chest. No, she couldn't let her cousin know the truth. Not now. Not ever. No, Sienna lied, her voice trembling. I'm sick. It makes me think weird things. That's why I write like that. But her cousin, with wide eyes and growing disbelief, pressed on. So you didn't use that magical sword to blow Art's neck off? Sienna shook her head, her hands cold and trembling. Her cousin's face fell, disappointment thick in her voice. Oh man, I thought it was real. I was enjoying it. Sienna's heart raced. She had to control the situation. Listen to me. Whatever you read in that diary, keep it to yourself, okay? Don't tell anyone. The words tasted like fear as they left her mouth. Her cousin nodded, promising. But later, in the hostel, she shared her twisted curiosity with a friend. I have to do it. I need to know more about Art's story to feel his fear. I want to know what it's like when he's close. How does he smile? What neither of them knew was that Art had already slithered into the hostel his ears sharp to their whispers. Hidden in the shadows, his smile widened, his bloodlust growing. So, she wants to feel me close, huh? He thought darkly. Then I'll give her what she's asking for. As Sienna watched the news on TV, her stomach turned to stone. Explosions in the mall, reported as an act of terror. But she knew better. This is Art's work, her mind screamed. Fear clawed at her insides as she thought of her brother. Without hesitation, she called him, her voice shaking. You have to come home. Now. Her brother, sensing the urgency, asked, Did you bring the sword? Yes, she replied, clutching the phone tightly. Her brother agreed to come. But before he could leave, their uncle went to the hostel to pick him up. That's when the horror truly began. In the bathroom, Sienna's brother's friend was with another girl when Art appeared, chainsaw in hand. Without warning, he attacked, his maniacal laugh echoing off the tiles. The friend was the first to fall, blood spraying as Art's chainsaw roared through her flesh. The other girl barely had time to scream before he brought the blade down on her head, carving through her skull with sickening ease. Art didn't stop until her face was unrecognizable, crushed beyond recognition. Yet, in her final moments, still clinging to life, Art leaned in close, his breath cold and foul. He smiled, a grotesque grin, and whispered, This is how I smile. Now you know. He wiped her existence from the world with one last stroke of his chainsaw, placing her blood-splattered glasses on her mutilated body and her friend, lying on the ground, barely alive, could only watch in horror as Art returned to his savage work. With brutal efficiency, he sawed her in two, the sound of the blade ripping through bone and flesh filling the room with a nightmarish symphony of death. 
Sienna awoke in a cold sweat, heart racing. It was 2 a.m., and the house was far too quiet, except for the voices of her uncle and aunt downstairs. But as she crept down to investigate, the sight before her drained the blood from her face. It wasn't her uncle and aunt. It was Vicky, mimicking their voices while Art stood over their mangled bodies. Her uncle's head had been torn from his body, his lifeless corpse pinned to the wall with nails. Before Sienna could react, a smaller, twisted version of Art lunged at her. She fought back, desperate to survive. But without her sword, she was powerless. Her eyes darted toward the weapon, but before she could reach it, the smaller Art struck her with a hammer, and everything went dark. When she regained consciousness, she found herself bound to a chair, her aunt tied to another chair across from her. On the table between them lay something covered. Vicky removed the tape from her aunt's mouth, and the woman sobbed. Where's my daughter? What did you do to her? With a wicked grin, Vicky looked at Art. Together, they revealed the horror on the table, a cage. Inside was a decapitated head, gnawed at by rats, flesh stripped away until only a skull remained. Sienna's aunt broke into hysterics. No, no, this isn't real. This is a lie. But Sienna knew. The nightmare had only just begun. As Vicky stood before her, Sienna's heart pounded violently in her chest. I don't believe you. This can't be my son's head. Her voice trembled, her denial masking the horror creeping into her soul. But Vicky's lips twisted into a wicked grin as he coldly continued his torture, showing no mercy. The room grew colder as Vicky shoved a rat down his victim's throat, the sound of its tiny feet scratching against metal, echoing in the room. Sienna's stomach churned, tears of helplessness welling in her eyes. Then, with cruel delight, Vicky detached her aunt's throat, ripping the rat from it, blood splattering across the room. Sienna gasped, frozen in horror as her aunt's lifeless body crumbled before her. She wanted to scream, but fear strangled her voice. Vicky turned to her, his expression full of sadistic satisfaction. Yes, she hissed, this isn't your cousin's head after all. Her words dripped with venom, and in front of Sienna, she crowned her with a crown of thorns, digging deep into her skin, drawing fresh blood. But Vicky wasn't finished. She turned to Sienna's cousin, who trembled in the corner, eyes wide with terror. I'll bring it there, Vicky sneered, as she slipped a pair of glasses onto the decapitated head. The world spun as Sienna's heart sank. Those were her brother's glasses. Her mind shattered in that moment, and her scream pierced the suffocating silence. No, she wailed, the sound desperate and broken, shaking her very core. But Vicky was merciless. Shut up, she barked, her hand tightening around Sienna's throat. There's no God here. Her words were sharp aimed to break Sienna's spirit. Vicky wanted control, to crush her will and force her into submission. But Sienna, despite the agony and fear, held on. She refused to let go of her courage, even as Vicky pushed her to the edge. You won't break me, she whispered defiantly, even as her breath faltered. Vicky's rage boiled over. She grabbed a knife and placed it against her cousin's neck. Watch me end her life, she snarled. But Sienna's cousin, in a moment of twisted clarity, spoke up, her voice barely above a whisper. If you two are angels, fulfill my final wish. Vicky paused, intrigued. Before I die, let me open my gift. Both demons smirked, agreeing to her request. But they didn't know. The gift was the key to their downfall. Inside the box was the magical sword Sienna's cousin knew could destroy them. Sienna will open it, her cousin said, hope glimmering in her eyes. With trembling hands, Sienna reached for the box. But just as she touched it, Art lashed out, breaking her fingers with a cruel crack. Pain shot through her but she gritted her teeth, pushing through. She had to open it. She had to. Finally, the box opened. The room was bathed in a magical light, and miraculously, Sienna's broken hands healed. She stood tall, the sword glowing in her grip. With a fierce battle cry, she slashed the sword through Art's throat, tearing him apart. Blood sprayed across the walls, but she didn't stop. She spun toward Vicky, her eyes blazing with fury, and plunged the sword into her chest. Vicky's scream echoed through the halls as Sienna twisted the blade, silencing her forever. But just as she thought it was over, Art lunged at her again, desperate for revenge. But Sienna was ready. With the magical sword, she met each of his blows, deflecting them with fierce determination. Their battle was violent, chaotic, a clash of life and death. But Sienna's strength surged as she drove the sword deep into his stomach, pinning him against the wall. Suddenly, the ground beneath them began to bubble and melt. Vicky's blood had turned to acid. The floor split open, and a fiery chasm revealed itself beneath Sienna's cousin. No. Sienna screamed as her cousin fell toward the pit, desperately clawing at the wall to stay above the flames. Sienna ran to her, extending the sword, but her cousin's hand slipped. In a moment of pure anguish, 
Sienna watched as her cousin fell into the abyss, sword in hand. Tears streamed down her face, the weight of her loss crushing her. I will go to hell, she vowed through gritted teeth. I will bring my cousin and the sword back, but as she turned, Art was gone. The window was open. He had escaped. The nightmare wasn't over. In the end, we see a young girl on a bus, lost in a book about demons. And then Art appears, taking a seat beside her, his eyes full of dark intent. The bloodshed was far from over. Sienna knew she had to follow him, to go into the depths of hell and retrieve the sword. With this chilling thought, the story ends. But the horror is just beginning. Thanks for watching.